All right. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul. How great thou art. All right. Which way to Nineveh? This question's easier to answer now that we have GPS. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer uh, in about 20 minutes from now. Who here finds the Lord's Prayer meaningful during a worship service? All right. Okay. Good. I really find it meaningful to have the Lord's Prayer in a worship service, praying it with others. Um, it's a model of prayer, but I actually like the actual words of the prayer. Well, I should not say that too boldly. Is there a, a line in the Lord's Prayer that if you were with Jesus, you could go, <clears throat> Jesus, I think you should remove that line. <laughs> Does anybody have a line... Jesus, I think you should remove that line in the Lord's Prayer. Nobody? I'm the only one? Wait, did you raise a hand? <laughs> okay, I like forgive our sins. And as Ellen has pointed out, this part about as we forgive those who've sinned against us. I don't like that one. It, it, it's it's, it's kind of like, no, I don't like it. it can, it's kind of convicting. I want to ignore it. I want to pull out a bottle of whiteout and put whiteout over that line. Some of you might go, it's ambiguous, Stan. But in two verses later, as you know, Jesus, after he gives the prayer, this is his next line, just to make it clear. A little clarity here. To the, for the disciples. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, there tends to always be one of those when it's important. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Who's with me now with the whiteout? <laughs> you know, there are some people in my life I don't want to forgive because it's very difficult. And then there are people in my life I don't want to forgive because it's fun not to forgive them. <laughs> All right, some of you don't have any idea what I might have said there. Okay, so here's the question. What do you do when you don't want to forgive? We're not going to really answer that question today. We're just going to open the door and go through the threshold of that question. This is a question to wrestle with throughout the week or throughout your life. What do you do when you don't want to forgive? All right, so let's talk about last week. Last week we began, I said, let us imagine this is us. Okay, I'm just going to put you, but I mean each and every one of us as you. Oh, you do have a body. Okay. All right. And I'm going to put other right here. You all remember? Who remembers this? Anybody remember last week? Okay, good, good. It's always nice when somebody remembers the little sermon from last week. Okay, and because of a circumstance, all right, I'm going to call it number one, all right, they have the power, and I'm just going to say, put you in prison, all right, and it, this could be a literal, it, it could be, you know, a figurative kind of thing, and then because of a circumstance, Another circumstance, number two, you have the power to exercise, I use the phrase tailspin that they find themselves in, because I don't know what other word. And here they are 
and they're in this situation because they have no body. All right. And we asked the question, what would you do? And I hope you were thinking about that this week. I hope you were going, you know, that has happened. That has actually happened in my life. You know, there was a situation in my life where somebody else had the power and I was placed in a prison or, you know. Anybody watch Bridgerton? Okay. Um, And then... The tables got turned, and I had the power because of another circumstance. And the question is, what do you do? Do you, like, exercise grace? And we, and we move from that question, and instead of putting you there, or me, we put Paul, and we put the jailer, and because of a circumstance, Paul found him, and Silas found themselves in prison, And this jailer is like given the responsibility to make sure you are in prison. And then because of an earthquake, the jailer thought all everybody left and he was going to kill himself. He was in a tailspin because if he didn't kill himself, oh, guess somebody else will because he had the responsibility. And then Paul exercised grace and said, stop, don't kill yourself. And then the jailer turned on the lights. And it wasn't like flipping a light switch in those days. And was able to go, oh, you guys did not escape. And of course, we asked the question, if you were one of those that were there with Paul, you might be going, what are you thinking, Paul? We, we almost had a, a way out of here. And then we asked the question, why did Paul do that? And we started with the answer of grace. But does anybody remember the next part of that? Oh, now you're being tested. Anybody remember? What? Oh, yeah. Pa- oh, yeah. The next part is in, in the timeline is he will get taken to Rome. But I mean, connected to grace, Paul was driven by seeing the jailer as image of God. Thank you. All right. These two things are important. Paul sees this person who created injustice in his life and mis- I'm going to say misused their power and, you could, and, and the part about Rome is a sign of is actually a very good argument of the misuse of power and that has to do with him being a Roman citizen but Paul seeing that person not as I would see him as an evil person die, die, die he said live, live, live because this person is seen as the image of God because we are created in the image of God and he exercised grace. Okay, that was last week. Let's find out what happens this week. This week, we talk about Jonah. All right. Who here, here's another question, Facebook land, you can answer this one. Who here has heard more than 10 sermons on Jonah? We got one? Anyone? Okay, bless you. Anyone else? Okay. Five sermons. Okay. Five. Okay. All right. So some of you have heard sermons on Jonah. All right. Let's take what we know about Jonah and apply it over here. So let us begin with the story of Jonah. Now, if you're here this morning and you're going, you know, I would like to read the Bible and I would like to start off with a book in the Bible. I don't want to start off with Deuteronomy because that would be a huge mistake. Or Leviticus. What book do you recommend? Well, I'd say Matthew, but if you're not a, a, a really serious reader, Jonah because it only has 48 verses. Four chapters, 48 verses. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, but I can't remember anything in Jude. <laughs> yeah. Jonah, I remember. You only have to read it once and go, oh, I got that story. Actually, there are people in this room who have never read this book and know the story, right? How many of you know the story of Jude? <laughs> But it's a great one because I like it. It's like, oh, it's only one page. I got this down. Okay. Jonah. 
Jonah begins <sighs> kind of like with a mission. Abraham, we get Abraham's life beginning with a mission. And the mission was to go west, young man. God told Abraham to go west. Go to the promised land, the land that I promise you. All right? Go. And you will be a blessing, and your descendants will be a blessing to all people. We talked about this uh, in January. That's called the Abrahamic covenant. It's essential to understand the New Testament. All right. So here's Ab uh, Jonah's mission. Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because of wickedness has come up before me. In some translations, it's evil ways. You've got to change your evil ways. <laughs> I don't even know what I just did there. <laughs> Ask the ones that are laughing. Okay. Okay, so Jonah, you have the power to go to this city called Nineveh and preach against it. Tell them to repent. Oh, let's put Jonah in this right here. Jonah is over here, and this is Nineveh. Nineveh, all right? They are the other, they, in a sense, are the jailer of their time. Jonah, go to Nineveh. What will you do? <laughs> What did he do? Anybody? He ran away. The next verse is, Jonah ran away from God. The question is, why did Jonah run away from God? Now, um, there is a debate on what year this takes place, but it takes place maybe 700 to 800 years before the birth of Christ. It takes place at a time when Assyria or Nineveh was powerful. And they, this Nineveh, was like this, using their power against the immediate world around them, which is the Israel as well. Does that make sense? So in a sense, this is Nineveh. They exercise their power. Here's Jonah. God gives them a message, kind of like Paul, to go to Nineveh and tell them, you got to change your evil ways. All right, so Jonah ran away from God. How did he run away from God? Boat. boat. Yeah, boat ticket. Yeah, I'll take that Titanic cruise. Um, <laughs> and um, It's interesting because he's running in the opposite direction of the way he's supposed to go. Now, there's a debate on which Tarshish this is. Is this like the Saul of Tarshish and all that? And there's a debate on that, but it's certainly going in the opposite direction of where uh, he's supposed to go. Jonah ran away from God. The question is, why did Jonah run away from God? Well, if we go back to our picture here, we could see why Jonah ran away from God. Because just like in Paul, or just like in your life, there is somebody, a jailer, as we said in Paul, who's used their power and they have kind of like held you down and now you have an opportunity to lift them up. Jonah doesn't want to do that. I'm with Jonah. Oh, really? Now, this is kind of a weird statement. Sometimes we're with Jonah when we refrain, we're not doing anything. We're just not doing anything. Are you with me? Jonah looks at them and says, no. What do we know next? God, as Jonah ran away from God, God runs, in a sense, towards Jonah, and he sends the storm. Now, this is an interesting part of the story. One of the inter more, it is a interesting part of the story because the storm is happening, and, and it's fascinating to kind of like ref reflect vigorously on this part of the story because what's happening is, okay, God goes, oh, Jonah, you're going the wrong direction. I want you to come this way. Go to Nineveh. And, and the storm comes. 
And so everybody on the ship is afraid. They're, they're scared. They're throwing stuff over. They're praying to their gods. And the captain of the ship is making sure everyone's praying to their different gods. We got to, whatever your God is, pray for, to that God because we want to make sure we touch every God we can think of, you know? And then he goes down in the ship. And what's Jonah doing? In the midst of this violent storm, Jonah is sleeping. 800 years later, there's going to be a violent storm on the Sea of Galilee, and all the disciples are going to be afraid. And where's Jesus? Down in the boat, sleeping. You're going, oh, that's kind of silly. Well, Jesus in Matthew 18 will say something like this. Just like Jonah, I will need to be where? In the earth for three days. Just like Jonah was in the whale for three days. No, it's great fish. Great fish. All right, you're right, you're right. It was a, it was a macro, a holy macro. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so as you know, uh, the captain goes down, how come you're not praying to your God? And you know, who is your God? And he tells him, I'm a hero and I'm on the run. You know? And so he gets up there and he's praying and they're still throwing stuff over and everyone's praying and nothing is happening. I mean, the violent storm keeps happening and they're going, okay, this is, this, we're at the end of our wits. What should we do, Jonah? It's your God that's mad at us. What should you do? Well, Jonah's kind of brave here. He says, throw me overboard. He, they, they, they go, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Poom, he goes overboard, and the big fish, the great fish, the whale, whatever it is, comes and swallows him up. And for three days, Jonah's in this whale, and he's praying. And he's praying this kind of idea, how great thou art. In a sense, you could say, as he's praying, then sings his soul, or then prays his soul. It is an incredible prayer. It's chapter 2 of Jonah. Take a, take a look at it. And then after he's through with the prayer, there's an ejection button. God takes that fish, takes him to Nineveh, ejection button, you know, there on the shore, he lands. Now, I don't know what you would have done if you're out there fishing on the shore of Nineveh and all of a sudden this fish goes, and there's this person. And of course, the person stands up and says, repent. What do you do? <laughs> so, so Jonah, now this is important. Jonah obeyed. And sometimes in our lives, we need a little extra push or vomit to get our lives moving in the right direction. But is he getting it moving in the right direction or is he obeying with the right motivation? He's doing this, but he's not doing it because of this. He's preaching. Uh, Nineveh is so big, it's got over 120,000 people. It takes him three days. He says, if you don't change your evil ways, Doom is coming. And then the king finds about it, out about it, and he makes sure everybody fasts. Even the animals have to fast. <laughs> you know, it's not even their fault. You know, animals fast. Everybody's fasting. And, and so what, is, what does Jonah do? I, I can kind of relate to this. Jonah's got that little evil part of him. He goes to the east side of, of Nineveh, where he just finished preaching for three days, repent. He gets up on a mountainside and he watches because he's hoping God will destroy Nineveh. He's hoping that they didn't really change their evil ways. I wonder who really needs to change their evil ways in this story. Okay? And then God sends this plant because it's hot in Nineveh. And as the plant grows, it creates shade. And and Jonah, in a sense, creates a relationship with this plant because it's giving him shade. He loves this plant because it's shade. It, and, and he's being driven by self-preservation instead of something else. And then the next day he gets up, hoping to see a destroyed Nineveh, and it isn't because they changed their evil ways. And God sent a worm in the morning to destroy that plant. And so Nineveh was saved... The plant wasn't, 
And Jonah cried about that plant. Now, if you want to see a weird ending to a biblical story, the last two verses are kind of like, huh? Because God says something that's very important, but we wanted something else, I think. God said, you know, Jonah, you're crying because of a plant. Think of me. I see a, over 120,000 people. My heart goes out to these 120,000 people. Where is your heart going out? That is the question all of us need to ask. Where is your heart going out? See, a lot of times in my life, I'm not driven by grace or the image of God in the other. A lot of times, I'm kind of like Jonah. This plant or something else in my life is more important than the actual person. I really believe that the purpose of life is relationship. And if the purpose of life is relationship, because life in our relationships are so messy, what is essential for our relationship is forgiveness. And forgiveness driven, not by self-preservation, but by grace, which is built on the foundation of seeing the other person as being made in the image of God. But too often in my life, I'm like the unmerciful servant. You remember the unmerciful servant? Too often in my life, it's Matthew 18, if you want to take a look at it. Yeah, Peter starts the conversation. So, how many times are we supposed to give? Seven? Because I'd be really cool if I gave seven times. I mean, I'd be awesome. What does Jesus say? Really, Peter? Seven? Not seven, but seven times seven. Or seven times 70, depending and then he tells the parable. And I'm going to change the parable for us to understand it. In a sense, that really hits home. Suppose you have a huge mortgage. And uh, your bank is calling in the loan. You can't pay it. And you go to the bank and you beg and you plead. I cannot give you all the money on my house loan. Because... Today, house loans are huge, aren't they? Imagine this. The, uh, we have Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo says to you, <clears throat> you know what? My heart is moved by grace. Your loan is forgiven. Would there be dancing in the street? And then you're, you're dancing in the street and you're going, life is wonderful. This is great. And then somebody comes up and you loan them some money to buy a cup of Starbucks coffee. I actually like Pete's, so I'm changing it to Pete's coffee. And you go, where's my money? And the person says, I ain't got no money. And you yell, cops! And you have that person arrested. How does Wells Fargo feel about that? Now, I'm not saying Wells Fargo is God, but how would God feel about that? How would God feel about forgiving all the sins of Stan because it's worth like, you know, a huge mortgage loan in these days? And I turn around and I can't forgive the other. Something is missing in my life. I need to see the other built on the foundation that the other is made in the image of God and I need to exercise grace. I need to not cry about the plant on the side of the east side of Nineveh. I need to be able to look at those who I consider my jailer. Now watch this as we close. Sometimes the prison is not really built by the other. Because when we do not forgive, we build our own prison. And God has called us to live life abundantly. And so we are called to live life abundantly, 
as we experience the forgiveness of sins from God, as we forgive the sins of others. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in our lives, we may have built our own prison by holding back grace, by holding back seeing the other being made in the image of God, by holding back because we like that leverage and power we have over the other when they are not forgiven in our lives. But as we build that leverage, as we build that power, we are slowly crafting our own prison. Because that is a prison that lacks grace. That is a prison that doesn't see the other being made in the image of God. That is a prison that will hold us from experiencing the joy and the abundance of life through living in your love, Lord. And so free us from that prison, we pray, Lord. Free us to understand the power of that phrase in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive our sins as we forgive others. And then help us to sing. Then sings my soul how great thou art. Because even Jonah knew how great thou art. Because Jonah knew that you are a God of grace and love. Help us to proclaim that in the lives next to us and close to us. To our children and grandchildren, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.